So at the moment it's both boys and girls. Originally it was just girls. The hard economics um, favour vaccinating girls because you, you get a much bigger uh, bang for your buck. Um, it's girls who get cervical cancer and initially at least they focused very strongly on cervical cancer. I think there was a bit of concern at the Department of Health that genital warts were a bit icky so they didn't want to mention them. Um, so they, they focused very much on the, on the cervical cancer. Additional benefit of vaccinating boys was thought to be relatively small, particularly in terms of cervical cancer. Of course, it has a much bigger benefit for um, genital warts. And when you look at the penile cancers and head and neck cancers and the anal cancers, the benefits add up. And it, they decided that in the end that it was, I think they decided it was cost effective to vaccinate boys, but there was also a, an equity issue, an equality issue, and it was perceived as being unfair to protect girls, but not to protect boys. And I think that the, the fairness argument might have weighed in there quite strongly, along with economic arguments there. The one we used initially, when we first introduced the programme, was a vaccine called Cervarix, which surprised many of us because it's, it's, it's only got the two strains that have caused the most cervical cancers and doesn't include the, the, the virus types that cause um, genital warts. So it would not have been beneficial in preventing genital warts. When the contract came up for renewal two or three years later, they went instead for Gardasil, which is the one that has had four strains in it, or four virus types, which would prevent the two most oncogenic strains and the two, two causing most of the genital warts. There's now another vaccine on the market, which is also from Gardasil, the same company. This has nine strains in it. So it has the, the two uh, genital wart strains, the two original oncogenic strains, and another uh, three, uh, four, sorry, I can't do my maths in my head, it has another five strains altogether, a total of nine strains covered, including the five next most likely strains to cause cervical cancer. So it prevents even more. They reckon that the original vaccine probably pre prevented about 70% of the oncogenic strains, or the, or the cancers rather, um, and the new one, the nine, the nine valent one, covers about 90% of um, cervical cancers. So the vaccine should prevent about 90% of cervical cancers. Note there's another 10% there that it won't prevent, which is why we need to continue uh, screening. And at the moment, as I say, that's done via HPV uh, testing to see if you have HPV uh, in, your, in your genital tract. The screening is much easier. You don't need to be up on a bench with a with a stirrups and a, and a speculum to take a vaginal swab. It should be a much simpler, less invasive, less unpleasant procedure. And if we can get to the stage where we can do urine samples instead, that'll be even easier, of course. We, we should be able to, it should be easier to do the screening. And 99, at least 99% of cases are caused by HPV viruses. Only 90% can be prevented with vaccination, but the remaining 9% you could, in theory, pick up with, with the screening, as long as people come in for the screening or, or, or send off the swabs. You know, if they do home screening, that's fine. It, it, it's a DNA a, a PCR test, so the swabs, home, home, swabs done at home are simple and easy to do and should be very effective. So we should be able to pick up quite a chunk of that, that remaining 9%. There'll still be the uncatchable final 1%, which may not be caused by HPV at all.